things. The first is to welcome the many people who are here as guests. Uh, there are a whole contingent from Casa Grande High School. There are members of the Alliance, there are members of our community. But most importantly for many of us, we have another founding member of the Alliance who is um, kind of a young person. She's been on the planet almost 100 years. And her name is Sylvia Sucker. She's sitting next to Professor Goodman. I can't tell you how much it means to all of us to have you here, Sylvia. And for our guests, if you didn't have a chance, there's a sign-in sheet just as you came in. We'd sure appreciate it if you would jot down your names, if you're already on our mailing list. And if you're not yet on our mailing list, just give all the information, and that way we can keep you in touch with our plans for the, the year to come. In addition to being the treasurer, I'm, I also got to be president of the Alliance for a few years, and it is an honor to be introducing the Robert L. Harris Memorial Lecture and providing some background about Robert L. Harris and the community group that supports this unique course. Some of you may already know about it. Some of you just think that the finances behind something like this are wonderfully mysterious. <laughs> Robert Harris was a World War II vet who retired and moved with his wife, Claire, to Sonoma County after a distinguished career in school teaching and administration, which included directing a school for troubled youth. He became active in the Jewish community and decided that a contribution he could make was to ensure that the students at all levels were educated about the Holocaust. At an annual Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Remembrance event, which was actually the seed for this lecture series. Um, this idea came up. The group had formed in Petaluma, and um, it grew into an annual commemoration of the Shoah, Yom HaShoah, which was commemorated in our community last week. The group included names that may not be familiar to you, Simon Jaffe, Joe Rappaport, who had immigrated from Europe and were in the United States during World War II, and Irv Newman, who had been coordinating the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising event. And an event uh, commemorating, that was a hard word, uh, Yom HaShoah, uh, held on this campus in the Commons in 1983, the university president at the time, Peter Diamandopoulos, was the keynote speaker. After the event, he challenged Robert, who was that year's coordinator, to do more than just memorialize the Holocaust annually in an event. And that began this university community partnership. Part of the justification for funding the group was training teachers. And I know that many of you are planning careers in teaching, and many of you are planning careers in serving your communities. It soon became apparent that SSU was an ideal place for a permanent program about the Holocaust. Professor John Steiner, a Holocaust survivor and professor of sociology, had already begun to teach classes that dealt with issues related to the Holocaust. In addition, Paul Banco, another Holocaust survivor, was a faculty member in the biology department, and George Jackson, a liberator, was a faculty member in our psychology department. During the spring of 1983, Robert Harris asked a number of people including Professor Benko, to assist him in responding to President Diamandopoulos' challenge. One of the first was Joel Newberg, who was working at the Holocaust Library and Research Center in San Francisco that had been established in 1978 by survivors. The center had sponsored lectures, but no real consistent program. He also invited our friend Sylvia, a retired teacher, who had recently moved to the area from New York. She knew Robert's wife, Claire, through her volunteer work with Hadassah. One of Professor Steiner's first students, Virgil Miller, who had been attending the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial events, was also invited to join the initial group. Robert added to the mix ministers, rabbis, and people like Evelyn Evie Sackler, one of his students, Eugene Kravitz, Irv Newman, and another local survivor, Walter Kuttner. Sylvia Sucker remembers Robert as 
an infatigable leader with enormous determination, who was able to work with all types of people and inspiration. As Joel Newberg recalled, Robert was one, a one-person organization. He knew what needed to be done, how to interface with individuals and groups, and how to handle all the, fi the fundraising, which was usually your share is, and your share is, and I'll, I'll take your checks at the end of the meeting. <laughs> we wish we could do it that way. Uh, the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust was formed in 1983 on behalf of the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and the desire to tell their stories and learn about their experiences. Those who began this collaborative effort between the community and members of the, of, of the university faculty <clears throat> promised to let the world know of the atrocities that had occurred. The initial intention was primarily to learn the facts, act on them, and never forget. As a result of these efforts, a highly successful lecture series on the Holocaust and genocide, now in its 29th year, was created at Sonoma State University. Initially, there were five to six lectures a year, and it grew into this amazing general education course that enrolls um, about 100 of you annually. Professor Steiner became the first director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust at Sonoma State, and Professor Myrna Goodman, then a returning student working toward her bachelor's degree, was the first student assistant hired by the center. Almost from the inception, the series has included lectures on other genocides, as well as the Holocaust. Slide. As a university community partnership, the alliance includes members of the community, university faculty, and administrators, and students who participated in the lecture series. Its current mission is to co-sponsor the lecture series, support Sonoma State Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide in providing programming to the larger community, including secondary education teachers, and to collaborate with other community groups working with issues related to the Holocaust and genocide. In 2010, it was renamed the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide to reflect its continuing education commitment to include all those affected by genocide. After Robert's death, the members of the Alliance decided to name an annual lecture in the series as a tribute to his unswerving dedication and commitment to Holocaust education. We are truly indebted to Robert for his vision and his leadership. For those of you interested in the history of the series, Please see our current board director, Christine Davidian, who's currently on jury duty and joining us later. She'll be bringing a binder to the stage after the lecture with flyers from each of the 23 years of the series. It is also our tradition to remember any Holocaust survivors in our community who've died in the past year. This year we'll be remembering seven of them. Charlie Baum, Paul Lichtman, Elsie Rich, Henry Sharp, Alice Stoller, Margaret Friedlander Stewart, and Anne Weinstock, as well as Newt Dybe, a Danish rescuer who shared his experiences with us many times as a speaker in the series. If you go back to the slide of, of um, Charlie Baum, there it is, thanks. Charlie was 19 years old in 1941 when the Germans marched into Radom, Poland and ended his education as a metallurgy student. He was conscripted to work 12 hours a day in a munitions factory by the Germans. When the war was ending, the slave laborers were transported to Austria to an extermination camp. Luckily, because the American armies were at the gates, the Austrians didn't let them in. So the prisoners found themselves being shuttled back and forth between Germany and Austria until the American army liberated them in December of 1945. He and his wife, Annie, met after the war and came to the United States in 1947. They eventually settled in Sebastopol, where he started a career in poultry. In, 19, in, in 2006, Charlie expressed gratitude that he was still young when he was liberated. Despite everything, he was determined to rebuild his life, and clearly he did. He died on January 26, 2012.
Paul Lichtman was born in Vienna in 1921. His father, Moritz, was arrested at his watchmaking and jewelry store during Kristallnacht and put into what was called protective custody. His father was coerced into signing papers that turned his business over to the Nazis. And as a condition of his release, he was told that he'd have to leave Austria. At the end of 1938, just a few months later, Paul received a visa and was able to leave for New York through the sponsorship of relatives living there. At the end of 1939, March of 1939, his parents left for Italy and from there sailed to Shanghai. In 1940, they were able to immigrate to San Francisco where they re were reunited with their son. Not unusual for people who fled, Paul served in the 6th Armored Division in both England and Germany during World War II. He was a past commander of the Jewish war veterans. In 1974, a diary written by his father about his experiences during and after Kristallnacht was discovered, and it was translated from German into English and published as the diary of Moritz Lichtmann. In, in 2004, a woman, a woman living in the apartment building in Vienna in which his father's shop had been located contacted Paul. She and a group of others had been attempting to locate the Jews who'd lived there prior to the Holocaust. In September of 2005, Paul and his son Barry traveled to Vienna for the dedication of a plaque on the building honoring its former inhabitants. Reflecting back on his life, Paul's advice was not to lose your faith. He also said, it's a terrible thing that people choose not to live in peace. He died on June 16, 2011, at the age of 90. Elsie Rich, who at the time of her death was the oldest Sonoma County resident, was born in Vienna in 1901. Toward the end of the 1930s, as Hitler rose to power in neighboring Germany, Rich and her husband Henry decided that Vienna was not a good place for Jews. They left for New York City in 1938 after Henry awoke one morning to see a Nazi flag draped across the hotel outside their home. Unlike many Jews in the area at the time, he felt Hitler was a serious threat. Most of the couple's family who stayed behind were killed in the Holocaust. Described as an unrelenting, joyful soul, Elsie Rich was renowned for her smile and kindness, her dearth of pity while playing Scrabble, her poetry, and her powers of recollection. She died on December 29, 2011, at the age of 110. Henry Sharp came from actually the same town as Charlie Baum, Radom of, well, he was born in Krakow, um, and he was born there in 1925. In 1942, he was interned by the Nazis in the Krakow ghetto, and subsequently in a number of concentration camps, including Berkenau and Buchenwald. He was liberated from Buchenwald in April of 1945. He emigrated to the United States in 1950, married his wife Rose, and settled in Oakland and then Sonoma. Henry was known as a generous, caring person who believed through his final days that there is always hope and life is good. He died on August 8, 2011. Alice Stoller was born in Vienna in 1923 and was sent to England on one of the kinder transports in May of 1939, where her mother had gotten a job as a housekeeper. Her father, who was in Paris as a journalist, was picked up and interned as an enemy alien and never got out of France. He ended up in two French concentration camps. He survived the war. Um, and was reunited briefly with his wife and daughter in London. However, as Alice recounted, the Brits who saved our lives deported him back to Vienna. He lived there several weeks, then had a heart attack and died. Mother and I decided to emigrate to America and begin life anew. I wish I could understand why we can't all get along. No progress yet, keep working at it. Her family said, she will be remembered for her generosity and her ongoing lifelong fight against injustices. She died on February 17, 2012.
Margaret Friedlander Stewart was born Margaret Kate Friedlander in Hamburg in 1930. She came to the United States with her parents and a brother as refugees aboard the last American ship to sail from Hamburg in 1939. Her parents made a new home in Cincinnati. She devoted much of her life to improving the lives of children as a high school English teacher, uh, a PTA regional president, and a juvenile justice commissioner. She's credited with establishing a first of its kind dental care program in the Santa Barbara, California schools, which gave low income families access to quality care. A thespian in college, she also was a dedicated supporter of the arts. She moved to Petaluma with her husband Marv in 2007 and died on August 29th of 2011. Anne Weinstock was born in a small German village but grew up in Berlin where she became a skilled surgical nurse. In early 1943, she was about to be sent to Bergen-Belsen but escaped from the Jewish hospital in Berlin where she'd been working as a nurse and did so by being hidden as a corpse in a hearse. After escaping from the hospital, she lived in hiding, finding safe places for short periods of time with non-Jewish relatives. She was recaptured the following year and was sent to the Little Fort, a former prison in Theresienstadt. In May of 1945, on the last day of the war, she was liberated by the Russian army. After the war, she returned to Berlin, got married, and in 47 moved to San Francisco. She settled in Petaluma two years later with her wa husband Walter, where the dream of a chicken ranch became instead a successful nursing home. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice, I think, this theme of chicken farming. Uh, it was very much a part of the Jewish community in Sonoma County. In 2006, Anne said, despite all my suffering and fighting for my life, crying for my family, I don't want my, to lower myself to the level of the Gestapo and my enemies. I cannot ever forget or forgive, but I do not want to hate. I have to remember that there were many good and decent people who helped us by sharing their food and lodging. For their sake, I will try to forgive. Anne, who has been a, a really key member of the Holocaust survivor community, died on September 2nd of 2011. And finally, we want to remember Newt Dybe, um, who was born in Denmark in 1915, worked in printing and advertising before Germany invaded Denmark in April of 1940, and then became a policeman early in the war when his business turned sour. He also became a member of the underground, participating in gathering intelligence for the Allies. In 43, when Newt learned that the Nazis were planning to round up Denmark's Jews and send them to concentration camps. He played a leading role in organizing commercial fishermen in Copenhagen's North Harbor to transport close to 2,000 Danish Jews in small groups to safety in Sweden. Almost all of the 8,000 Jews living in Denmark were rescued within a matter of weeks. Nude immigrated to the United States after World War II. In the 1980s, he began to speak about his experiences warning his audiences that the Holocaust an example of what can happen when good people fail to stand up to hate, and said that everybody had a responsibility to stand up, no matter the consequence. In 1999, he turned his story into a book, Boats in the Night. Beyond the World War II heroism, he was proud to have designed the paper clip container with that nifty little magnetic ring in the middle <laughs> of that plastic box that many of you have found on desks throughout your lives. <laughs> or at least throughout the later part of your lives for the rest of us. He died on September 8, 2011, at the age of 96. Our community is diminished by the loss of these very, very special people. Thank you. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say, first of all, how very much I enjoyed meeting many of you at your lovely reception for me earlier today. This is always a pleasure. On a long
long tour like this, when I must make so many speeches about my new book, you can imagine how everything can begin to seem the same after a while. But when I feel your generous interest and sympathy as one human being towards another, this is when I think, yes, I am reaching someone. Now, some of you had questions for me during the reception, and I want to try to answer some of these first. The young man in the brown jacket, over there, you ask the question, how did he put it? Can I reconcile making music, which is a pure and sacred thing, is it not? For the amusement of murdering butchers. He did not attempt to spare me, this young man. Or perhaps he is being kind. He sees an old lady, maybe French, maybe not quite French, with unhappy memories. He means perhaps to ask, how can I look back on it now and not feel I was a whore? I used my art for gain while others were annihilated without pity. Oh, my dear young men, this question is not new to me. It is true, I did this in the extermination camp Auschwitz-Birkenau, in the lager. I played and sang and arranged scores, even beat on the drum for the Nazi killers. Every day, I live with this truth. But then I look around me today in a much easier, happier time and see the artists, the singers of talent, sell themselves and their dearest art for much less. For success or money only. To be rock stars. What I did, I did for life. For life, for one more day of life, one precious, beautiful day. Un bel di. Un bel di. Un bel di. I don't usually do this, but I see there is a piano here in the auditorium. Let me show you how it happened.
tout nu. Il se refasse et disait à tout nu, mais là, il se I did not question, ask, at what price life? day follows upon another. The moment of rescue is past, and you look about.
then am I here? We must do our work properly, give satisfaction, says Alma.
dying in our own filth. It is the end. I dream of silence. And then it is the guns have stopped. I drift, I drift. 
much. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, where the, the actual performance came from. Is it a, a piece that was designed or um, is it based on a, a true story? I, I'm okay. kind of in the background. Um, let me just explain a little bit about the background of the piece itself. Um, as you may or may not know, one of the very earliest Holocaust memoirs was played for time. Actually, it was published in French as Sourci pour l'orchestre by Fanny Fenelon. And this made a great deal of uh, sensation when it came out in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, as one of the very first memoirs, there weren't so many as there are now. For sure, there was no Holocaust Museum. The Holocaust, in many ways, was a kind of a taboo subject. Survivors who were then in their 40s, 50s, 60s, who felt that they still had some life ahead of them, didn't want to look back. And Fenelon's friends, women who had been in the orchestra with her, uh, warned her against writing about it and publishing it. But she did nevertheless, and she became quite famous. She was interviewed on 60 Minutes um, by, I believe, Mike Wallace or Maurice Sacro, one of the guys who looks to be about 90 now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, that was when I saw Fenelon on TV uh, as a young woman and remembered her saying how she had taken on an audition by singing Umberdi, the famous aria for Madame Butterfly, and accompanying herself. And so that made a real impression on me because that's every musician's nightmare that you, know, you have to play an audition, the music is unfamiliar, you haven't practiced in six months, you know, and if it doesn't go well, something terrible is going to happen. Well, in her case, that is exactly what would have happened to her, is that her life expectancy in Auschwitz would have been just a matter of a few months. But by joining the camp orchestra, she was able to buy more time for herself with slightly better conditions and food and sanitation. Well, this made a very strong impression. It was bought by uh, producers who wanted Arthur Miller to write a television play about it, <coughs> which he did, called Playing for Time. And this became a very honored uh, television movie with Vanessa Redgrave playing the part of Fenelon. And uh, Jane Alexander as Alma Rosé. The movie is very different from what I do, and I'll get to your question in a second. It dealt mostly with the social aspects of life in the camps, how women formed friendships, how they uh, gained courage and strength from each other, how they betrayed each other, etc., etc. When I decided to create a piece about this, I really had already a piano career behind me and was looking to enlarge the scope of my creative and performance work. So I was interested in pieces that had a component of self-accompanied performance, okay? So the name of this piece, in case you don't know, is An Evening with Madame F. It is not called Playing for Time, and it is a very different kind of piece entirely because it is a solo piece in which a woman confronts her own, own conscience in a way and the imagined rebuke of the public that she has survived by prostituting her art, that she is now capitalizing on it by writing a best-selling novel or book or whatever. And so the, the piece has many facets to it, in addition to being a narrative that goes inside the artist who was forced to do those kinds of things, who had to be able to do everything that was asked so that you know, she never once could say no. And this took a terrible toll. The piece itself reflects the kind of a grotesque environment that they lived in, the virtuosity of being able to do all these things, not just individually, but at the same time. What I do up there is very, actually very difficult. It's very hard to play the piano while doing other things. 
So the medium of piano play while speaking, while singing, reflects that kind of grotesque, forced versatility of these people. And so in its way, it is really a quite unique um, way of shining a lens on this kind of experience and at the same time enabling audiences to see to see what to get some sense of the Holocaust. We never really can totally understand this through this very small prison. So that was more than you asked. But Thank you very much. Other other comments or questions? Yes. I can't hear you, so I'm translating. I really, uh, I'm talking, I feel kind of Italian, so Italian. I, I am really moved by your performance, all the opera that I sang when we were children, I can remember that. And uh, I lived in every part of your years and then came here and then went back again and then came back. I, I'm, I'm just so moved by your performance. Thank I, you. From your piano today. Oh, well, okay. now, one of the things about this about this play is that it's been around now. This is my twenty third season performance. <laughs> I've done it hundreds of times. Each time is different, and I feel the vibes from the audience. I feel you know every sort of response possible to, that comes in my direction, and. It's very, very important to me to know that it is touching and reaching people, although I, I would hope also that it exercises the mind as well as the heart, as we were saying earlier today. Yes? How does integrating this woman of the particular pieces of music in the performance uh, 
they're very powerful individually. Um, how much of that is is based on the events, and how much of it is is taken as a little bit of artistic license to sort of project? In particular, the Marseillaise at the end. Well, I think that's yes, very... that, that was actually that's based on fact. Okay. Fenelon sang the Marseillaise when the British came to Bear the and uh, was broadcast on the radio. Then after that, she sang all the other uh, national anthems of the Allies. She at that time weighed 60 pounds. So in a matter of hours or days, she would have been dead. But the act of, of, of expressing, and it really didn't matter so much that she sang the Marseillaise but that. She did sing, that she expressed herself. is really absolutely germane to what the piece is about. That she begins by asking, you know, uh, should I have done these things? Then she relives where in the camp she uh, sings in order to live. And then at the end, she realizes she lives in order to sing. And that's sort of a very, very special, maybe slightly heady thing. But I'm glad you asked about the music. There is a composer. Uh, if we had a program, we wouldn't have the credits that, that show that the, the original music was composed by Fred Cohen who was a musical colleague of mine in Virginia, who's now um, at a college in Georgia. And what we did was we sat down together and we decided what music would be used. And uh, the memoir of Finding Fenelon included reference to a number of pieces. Some of them we could use, like the Reverie, which becomes all distorted, you know, and she's trying to hold on to that one note, and the Reverie just becomes all the chest cavity. But then Fred thought, well, why don't we use some of the other scenes from childhood? That is a piece from uh, Schumann's Scenes from Childhood. It's a very sort of famous piece that children play, the Reverie or the Troymerai, as it's called, it's called in German. And so we had two other Schumann pieces that came to various places along the way. <clears throat> we included uh, the, the aria at the end, Dinus Meinganz's Herz, uh, because in Fenelon's memoir, she referred to that opera where this comes from, which is called, sorry, it's called The Land of Smiles. Dionysus Mangas' Hits comes from The Land of Smiles by Lake Art. Is anybody up there? Hang <laughs> up here, sorry. Um, so instead of uh, using a duet, which she sang with her friend in the camps, we had her sing a solo of Dinosaur and Dinosaur, which is usually sung by male uh, singer. So the, the decisions were musical and um, as well as contextual, and we tried to make the rest of the things that I'm playing the piano, none of it is improvised. It is all so thoroughly worked out. All those individual notes and chords and passage work um, were very, very carefully planned and plotted. Okay, yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. There doesn't seem to be a last question. <laughs> there it is. There it is. There it is. It's a it's a a Please talk loudly. Um, I wanted to say bravo, and I've never seen uh -huh. anything quite like this. And for us to go through this experience of all of the different Holocaust genocides, um, I, it was really moving to see it put to music, and especially opera, because the, it's, opera can be so tragic. And of course, we all know what has happened, and I just wanted to say it was amazing, and I will never, ever forget this, and I'm hoping that I will be able to see it again. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.